Good evening, everybody, and welcome to August 2nd Talking History Online. So Talking History is a long-standing program of the History Trust of South Australia, um, and because everything's changed this year, we're offering it as an online webinar. So thank you for joining us. So we always begin um, events uh, at the History Trust with uh, an acknowledgement or a welcome to country, and I'd just like to acknowledge uh, that I'm here and the History Trust today is here on Ghana country, Ghana land. We recognise the continuing connection of Ghana people with country and we also pay our respects to elders past and present. Now, since you're all, some of you are in other parts of the world and some of you are in other parts of Australia, you might just want to take a moment to acknowledge um, the country that you might, might be on. Thank you. So we're now at the beginning of the, uh, the uh, evening. There's a few rules of engagement for um, as our Zoom webinar. So firstly, just make sure you're comfortable. I've got a note here that says, make sure that you know where your toilets and emergency exits are, which sounds a bit like something you might do on an aeroplane. Um, get a, a glass of water if, or a cup of tea, whatever you feel like for the next hour or so we're going to be sharing. So the way that, the, the proceed, that we're going to proceed this afternoon, this evening, is I'm going to um, give a very uh, short introduction to the subject, and then I'm going to introduce um, uh, our, our speakers, Dr. Jim Hamilton, Dr. Moya McFadgen, and then Moya is going to also introduce our third speaker, Jan Coolen. At the end, we're going to have um, questions and answers. So please, if you've got questions as we go along, pop them into the Q&A. If you've got things that you'd just like to share with other participants, pop them into the chat function. And you can just do that as we go along. I'd ask all participants, please, to mute yourself, um, but leave, leave your video on. Um, sorry, if, if you could be muted and without your videos. Um, so use the chat function to communicate with us. There might be some, if you've got questions that we can't answer um, this evening, we can take them away and try and answer them for you um, later so we can keep in contact with you. And I did want to remind you that this session will be recorded and it'll be available on the History Trust SoundCloud and YouTube accounts um, in the coming weeks. So you can share it with other people who maybe weren't able to make it this evening. And I should introduce myself. My name's Mandy Paul and I'm, um, I work for the History Trust. My job is Director of the Migration Museum, Major Projects Research and Collections. So this evening we're going to talk about British migration to Australia um, between about 1947 and 1981. Um, and the reason that we're doing this is, apart from it being a, a subject of abiding interest um, and relevance to South Australian history, um, it's also the subject of an exhibition called British Migrants Instant Australians with a question mark at the end. British Migrants Instant Australians. Um, and that exhibition um, is currently on, on show at the Migration Museum at 82 Kinto Avenue, Adelaide. And it was the exhibition came to us, it was curated by uh, a team at Museums Victoria, led by Moya, which is uh, who's going to speak about that experience this evening. So between 1947 and 1981, nearly one and a half million Britons migrated to Australia and possibly seduced by promises of sun, surf and a better life. And many of the newcomers came on assisted passages, part of the Australian government's explicit pursuit of a white British nation. This group of migrants were simultaneously everywhere and invisible, expected to become instant Australians. But of course, the reality of migration is not like that. It's never that simple. So this exhibition, British Migrants, Instant Australians, developed by Museums Victoria and currently here at the Migration Museum in Adelaide, explores personal experiences and historical and contemporary impacts of British migration to Australia in the post-war decades. And the exhibition, one of the really special things about the exhibition is that it features stories told from a range of perspectives. That is stories told by children, teenagers and families, labourers, adventurers, returnees, musicians, and even a snake dancer. And these stories are brought to life 
through really compelling digital animation and we're going to show you one of those this evening. So I'm glad that you're here to share um, this panel with us and we're going to kick off. The first person who's going to speak is Dr Jim Hamilton, who's an Emeritus Scholar at La Trobe University in Melbourne. His most recent publications on post-war British emigration from Britain are with Alistair Thompson, the classic Ten Pound Poms, A Life History of Post-War British Emigration to Australia, which was published in 2005, and Migrants of the British Diaspora Since the 1960s, Stories from Modern Nomads, which is published in 2017 and 2019, two editions. His current research focuses on the history of an English expatriate extended family in Russia, Iran, Iraq, Russia, Iran and Iraq in the early 20th century. So with no more ado, I'll hand over to you, Jim. Thank you. Thank, thanks very much, Mandy. Uh, it's great to talk to this, uh, this group, if, if that's what it is, um, from Melbourne. Uh, I first saw this exhibition in Melbourne uh, quite some time ago now. Um, under very different circumstances from what we're doing here tonight. Uh, but it's nice to get a bit of variety. I want to take up from uh, where uh, Mandy just left us about the question mark that's posed by the exhibition. Uh, uh, were post-war British migrants instant Australians? And instant Australians, I take to mean that the British were in some ways, uh, if this is true, different from other migrants. By virtue of their British heritage uh, and English language, they didn't experience the problems of adjustments and integration suffered by others, especially the non-English speaking, and that's the usual comparison that's made. That is, it was easy, an easy ride for them, much, uh, much like moving from one part of Britain to another. And a very few of the people we interviewed for our books actually said precisely that. Of course, you don't need to go far past some of the hugely diverse range of experiences conveyed in the exhibition to realize that this was not the common story. British migrants certainly had some unique advantages over others, not least their common language. But they were still migrants, still faced with similar problems suffered by other migrants, uh, like the hostile living experience, the culture shocks of various kinds, homesickness, unemployment and financial crises, family dissension arising from migration as well. And this applied to migrants from what is often called austerity Britain. Remember, this is a long period from 1947 to 1981, roughly in the 1940s and 1950s, uh, as well as those during a period of rising expectations, relative prosperity in the 1960s and 70s. And if you've listened to some of the stories in the exhibition, you'll know how complex these stories can be, from the extremes of disappointment uh, to celebration, often a disappointment celebration experienced over time in the same people. Among several hundreds of people that we interviewed for the 10 pound palms and other books, we found a similar spectrum of experiences that spread from those extremes of catastrophe at one end to dream runs of success, prosperity and contentment at the other. Somewhere in between, of course, with the majority who spoke regularly of some years of struggle to achieve eventual uh, prosperity, usually marked by home ownership and attachment to Australia, very often in the same occupations that they'd had at home. Uh, so they're perhaps eventual Australians rather than instant ones. And not surprisingly, it was the catastrophe horror stories that commanded most attention publicly. Uh, prompting hostile strikes like those in Melbourne. Uh, and the stories included false public relations, promises of instant employment and easy housing as soon as you landed, uh, all those hopes being dashed on arrival for so many and leading to downward occupational mobility for many. They couldn't get the job that they were trained in. Uh, sometimes mental collapse and marital and family breakdown. Some stories like this are really haunting tragedies. Among those horror stories are many that led to return to Britain, and the exhibition gets into those as well. And return migration is an important part of the post-war British migration experience, uh, as it is for nearly all migrations. To place this in context, let's remember that during the period covered by the exhibition from 47 to 81, uh, the numbers were very, large, as Mandy has, has, uh, has indicated, uh, 
you get different readings depending on which statistics you look, look to, but about one and a half million. Most of those were assisted migrants, the 10 pound palms, uh, some 400,000 odd paid their own way. So in total, well over one and a half million British migrants. And of course, the migrants kept coming after 1981, although in slightly lesser numbers. Now, we don't have exact numbers for how many people returned to Britain. They were never recorded as returnees. Uh, they're too hard to distinguish from temporary British travelers. But from surveys, we do know that in most years, between 20 to 30 percent of them went back. That's a huge part of the one and a half million. Say at 25 percent, something like 400,000 who broke up their homes in order to travel to Australia only to admit uh, some sort of defeat and go back. Uh, uh, some, of course, returned to Australia, the well-known boomerang mi migrants. And bear in mind that most would have had to wait two years before returning in order not to have to repay the subsidy they'd had in coming out uh, to Australia on top of the return fares they had to pay to go. And of course, it's this scale of return that contributed to the, the well-worn insult by some Australians against the British, and we found a few British who accuse other British as well, of being whinging palms. Uh, supposedly always complaining about Australia, how much better it was back home, and so on. Let me give you one brief story to illustrate how complex those return stories could be, and how nothing is ever quite as simple as it looks. Carol Brooks was one of those many women we encountered who, against common expectations, took the initiative and made the decision to take herself and her reluctant husband, David, to Perth from Brighton in 1969. Both were doing well enough at work. Carol is a hairdresser, David is a fisherman. But her marriage was faltering, largely due to David's heavy drinking. Assured that they would both find work in their occupations in Perth without any delay, uh, Carol's thinking was that she could get David away from his drinking mates, uh, which would solve the problem. Thinking uh, that everything would be fine once she got there. Once I got him out to Australia, he'll change, she thought. Presumably not knowing much about Australia's own drinking culture. I never thought of Australia as a drinking place, she laughed many years later. Their problems started on arrival. Neither were able to surmount obstacles to entering their own occupations. So David retra retrained as a bus driver, then started a small business. And Carol waited two years. She regarded it as a life, a prison sentence, she said, uh, and wanting to return all the time before she could uh, then finally re-qualify re as a hairdresser. Both then did reasonably well. Uh, with the ingredients of a migrant success story. Occupationally, it was fine, eventually. But success bred an active social life which fed David's drinking. The old problems resurfaced and the marriage deteriorated. So in 1974, Carol flew back to England to escape from the marriage and to raise her three-month-old baby with support from her parents while David stayed in Perth. She later remarried and she reflected that, to be quite honest, if I'd been with the husband I'm with now, I'd probably have still been there. So return migrants have stories every bit as complex as those who stayed, and they complicate those easy judgments made about whinging palms. Uh, interestingly, many of the returnees we interviewed look back fondly on their years in Australia and characterize them as the best years of our lives. Many returned reluctantly to care for an ailing parent or because of family tragedy. Some like Carol, because of family breakdown. So the apparent horror stories are not always what they seem to be. And return migrants were not so different from others. The success stories are complicated too, of course, like John and Maureen Butts, who left Lancashire for Melbourne in 1959. John was dissatisfied with his job of toolmaker and Maureen struggling to balance childcare with a succession of uh, hard to get part-time jobs. Their struggles in Melbourne continued when they moved to the southern suburbs of Perth, where further education and job changes for John led to eventual success, work in public administration and eventual, eventually he was elected to the Rockingham Town Council. Home ownership and a beach house were, as for so many, markers of their success and their commitment to an Australian lifestyle. So material success. 
that integration was a, uh, into a suburban community in Perth was a different matter. They found that neighborhood acceptance meant joining marathon drinking bouts, and they were judged to be standoffish palms and not part of the community because they didn't drink. Echoes there, of course, of Carol Brooks's experience with her husband's drinking. Uh, and a depressing contrast to the close-knit neighborhood they found uh, that they'd enjoyed in Lancashire. But the Butts got around that by cultivating family-friendly networks and work-based friendships outside the neighborhood. And for them, there was never a suggestion that the struggles that they faced uh, would turn them against Australia or turn them against each other, threaten their marriage in any way. Like so many of the married people we talked to, they insisted that their difficulties, they would put it, brought us together instead of pulling them apart. One recalled that if anything, it cemented it. You've only got each other. So we relied on each other. So all that sounds like relatively easy adjustment, which might support the eventual Australians argument. But there's another way of looking at this, which is about loyalty and heritage. One of the things that most surprised us in interviews was a relatively casual attitude to national attachment to Britain, even among those who'd suffered great homesickness. Alongside close loyalty to family left behind and to close friends in local neighborhoods in Britain, and often a deep nostalgia for the countryside, there was a frequent hostility to what some called clannishness or overt celebration of British loyalty through joining ethnically based organizations like the English in Australia, the Union Jack Society, some of them go back a long way, uh, the UK Settlers Association and so on, and the Scots and Welsh had their own particular groups. Well, there's always been some enthusiastic support and membership for these organizations, as well as for English cricket and the Barmy Army, the clannishness has always been from a minority of migrants, which was reflected in our interviews. This is in sharp contrast to the variety of Italian and Greek loyalty clubs that you find, uh, like the Benito and Calabria clubs, and so on, all very popular since the 1950s and still very popular. Maggie Campbell in Sydney couldn't understand why people felt the need to join all British societies and thought that maybe it's because I've always been so happy and contented here, it just hasn't bothered me. And this is apparent too in citizenship ceremonies. Still, Maggie, like many others, retained a sentimental attachment to Britain, which is most common, alongside her stronger commitment to, to Australia. But most often it's loyalty to the family left behind in Britain, which overshadows uh, attachment to the, to the nation. For many, this has meant that many years later, their awareness of themselves as somehow different because they're migrants or wearing a migrant identity, never quite one thing or the other, is stronger than those purely British or, pure, or for that matter, purely Australian identities. Finally, there's one other twist to this story of migrant identity. And Britt, if you could put that slide up now, that would be good, thanks. This photograph, if you can see it, uh, of migrants queuing in the rain in Manchester to apply for a passage to Australia could have been taken in any of the years uh, after 1947, save perhaps for some of the clothing styles, when so many migrants gave climate as a reason for wanting to leave. But as the caption shows, this was taken in 1981, long after the 10 pound pom period reached its peak and significantly just before the fair subsidy and this exhibition ended. Uh, the, the, the subsidy ended uh, at the beginning of 1982. This was during the recession and high unemployment of the, the early 1980s induced by some of the deregulation reforms of the Thatcher government. And many migrants of that time referred to themselves as Thatcher's refugees. It was also the period of the escalation of globalization. Younger migrants, especially often backpackers who might stay on, move on uh, as serial migrants. They were less likely to be attached to any particular destination or national identity. There are plenty who were, but the, this is a new trend in the 1980s setting in. The increasingly popular phrase, I'm a citizen of the world, sharply distinguished them from those migrants of the previous four decades, all seeking a better life and self-improvement. Citizens of the world then, I'll leave you with this, conjures up something quite different from exclusive British or Australian identities. And perhaps that could be the theme for another exhibition. Thank you. Oh, thank you 
Jim, that's really thought provoking. And I'll just take, I'll file away that idea. I have to discuss it with Moya. Yeah. An idea about being citizens of the world and its relationship to migration. Now, just a reminder to our participants, if you've got questions for Jim, um, please pop them in the Q&A and um, I'll, I'll turn to that later when everybody's had a chance to speak. So our next speaker this evening is Dr Moya McFadgen, who's the Senior Curator of Migration and Cultural Diversity in, in the Society and Technology Department at Museums Victoria, based in Melbourne. She's responsible for developing the, for the, developing the museum's migration and cultural diversity related collections and exhibitions. And her curatorial work focuses on the application of material culture and memory of migration and cultural diversity to interpretations of Australian migration narratives, as well as museums of sites of social activism and their potential for developing relations of genuine engagement and reciprocity with communities. Over the last I should say Moya's been working on fabulous exhibitions for longer than this, but over the last 10 years, highlights her achievements include the following at the Immigration Museum, an exhibition called Identity, Yours, Mine, Ours, of which she was lead curator, and that was 2011, and that was a really fabulous exhibition. This exhibition, British Migrants and Australians, on which she was lead curator, which uh, debuted at the Immigration Museum in 2017, an exhibition called Love, uh, which was at the Immigration Museum in 2018, and the one that's currently in development, which must be uh, nearly ready to go one day when the museums reopen in Victoria, called, or in Melbourne, called Becoming You, an Incomplete Guide, on which Moya's again been lead curator. So integral to all these exhibitions has been her engagement with diverse communities and creative practitioners and developing innovative approaches to storytelling through the authentic voice. Thank you, Moya, and I'll hand over to you. Thanks, Mandy. I'll just work my way to my PowerPoint. So I'm hoping everyone can see that now. So thanks, Mandy, for the introduction and for the invitation to participate in this online forum. I'm so delighted that this exhibition, which began its life at the Immigration Museum in Melbourne, has been able to enjoy a new life for new audiences at the Migration Museum in Adelaide, uh, one of our closest partners. I would like to just now acknowledge the traditional owners on the, of the land on which I am speaking today, the land of the Wurundjeri Woiwurrung people of the East Kulin Nation, and also the land on which the British Migrants Exhibition is now situated, the people of the Ghana Nation, and pay my respects to all their elders, past, present and emerging. Sovereignty has never been ceded. I would also like to acknowledge my former Museums Victoria exhibitions team, too numerous to mention everyone, but in particular, uh, colleagues, Dr. Sophie Couchman, who was my fellow curator on this project, and Emily Cocage, its project manager. So British Migrants Instant Australians presented at the Immigration Museum in 2016-17 and now at the Migration Museum in Adelaide presents the history of post-World War II British migration to Australia through the lenses of a privileged cohort which was part of the Australian government's white British Australia agenda, the persistent assumptions relating to easy assimilation and a singular migration experience without diversity or complexity, and the residual meanings for contemporary Australian society relating to Australian and British identities, multiculturalism, invisibility, and First Peoples perspectives. A question we were often asked while we were developing this exhibition was, why British migrants and why now? Firstly, Melbourne's Immigration Museum, which opened its doors in 1998, had never presented an exhibition solely focused on these migrants the largest single group to originate from one geographical place and the largest wave of migration in Australian history. Nearly 1.5 million people from the UK arrived in Australia between 1947 and 1981, the period of financial assistance offered to two thirds of these migrants. As a migrant group, they are both invisible yet all pervasive and their presence shapes what it means to be Australian today in more ways than might first be imagined. 
This alone suggests a story worth acknowledging and reflecting on. Secondly, if we wanted to tell the story through the voices of people who lived it, we needed to do it soon as this cohort grows ever smaller. And with my apologies to you, Jan, because you're still going strong, of course. The personal storytelling is at the heart of the exhibition and its power in the authentic voices. We focus on the vast majority of migrants who arrived from the UK, as opposed to those British subjects from former British colonies and Commonwealth countries. And we decided not to represent the experiences of the thousands of unaccompanied children who came to Australia as part of child migration schemes after World War II, a very different and complex story which had already been told in another touring exhibition. Thirdly, it was important to place these personal stories against the political agenda that encouraged this migration. The Australian government offered financial incentives to encourage British migrants to help build a predominantly white and British Australian population after World War II, reinforcing the long established white Australia policy cemented through the 1901 Immigration Restriction Act. While not consciously participating in this white British nation building project, British migrants were complicit by taking up the generous offer. It's not a history we wanted to shy away from. The other side to this coin is that the promises made by the Australian government in lavish advertising campaigns of jobs, homes, sun, lifestyle, and a seamless assimilation did not prove to be the case for some. And as Jim's mentioned, our exhibition title signals that our approach to this subject might not be what visitors expect, and we wish to pose questions and provoke discussion. While this migration history has not been told in depth in museum exhibitions previously, it is a history that has been well documented, including by such historians as Jim Hamilton. Thus our aim was not simply to simply retell those histories or to follow a chronological narrative or even present a community story through the more conventional stages of migration, such as leaving home, the journey, immediate arrival, settlement and contribution. This exhibition attempted a different and non-linear thematic path. The context of, of British preferential treatment and Australian nation building, the subtle and overt diversity within the mass numbers of people, the contrast between individual experiences of migration and the ongoing relevance of this story to Australia today. So while acknowledging and celebrating British migrant stories, we wanted to demonstrate how this history still resonates. It is relevant to any discussion about Australian identity, citizenship, and the nature and inclusivity of multi multiculturalism. It prompts us to reflect upon notions of privilege, the privileges British migrants received over other migrants, and the privileges most migrants gained over First Peoples, for whom even the fundamental rights of census recognition were still being fought for in the 1960s when migrant numbers were peaking. Consequently, the development of the exhibition became an interesting dichotomy between national and personal narratives and between individual and collective experiences. It was an exercise in trying to dispel some of the myths about British migration that have tended to assume that this is an amorphous mass of people who could seamlessly assimilate into Australian society. And for some it was, but it is also the story of people who experienced hopes and disappointments, grief, homesickness, and even prejudice. Again, the question mark in our exhibition title signals that assumptions about the instant assimilation of British migrants because they were British needs to be examined, as is the assumption that British migrants were all the same. But there was diversity within this cohort, regional differences, accents, faiths and class, as well as the more obvious cultural and historical identities in the UK between English, Scots, Welsh and Northern Irish, and of course their lived experiences. An online community content gathering website invited story contributions to the exhibition. Over 100 responses provided both a source of our focus stories, but also the foundation for a soundscape which captures the experiences of leaving home, why people came, their journey experiences and immediate first impressions of people arriving over three decades. And as you can see from this image, Visitors can lean into an installation of teacups, which range in style from the 1950s to the 1970s, and listen to over 70 reminiscences brought to life by, act by actors. They can hear the variety of accents and regional localities of this enormous mass of people through a more collective experience. 
At the heart of the exhibition are 13 personal stories which cluster into four life stages, families, young adults, teenagers and children. These accounts reveal the complexities of individual experiences even within a family group and give voice to the perspectives of children and teenagers, like Jan, often presented as silent participants in migrant narratives. And if you look carefully uh, on my current slide, you'll see Jan is the one wearing the pink dress who's dancing with the very dashing young man right in the centre of the screen. Our storytellers recall leaving behind beloved grandparents as children, being separated from friends, family and the cultural life of 60s London and Liverpool as teenagers, the excitement, freedom and independence a £10 travel fare offered young adults, and the separate challenges posed by resettlement for all these age groups within one family unit. We also felt it was important to tell two stories of those who returned to the UK, which were a quarter of those who migrated did, and another who returned and then came back again, which one quarter of the return migrants did. These return migrant interviews were recorded back in the UK. This exhibition content was developed through the community engagement practices of genuine collaboration with the storytellers, from the initial point of story selection, through pre-interview conversations, provision of interview questions for consideration, post-interview support, consultation throughout the editing process, and final approval. This process required the establishment and constant nurturing of trust between museum staff and their storytellers for whom this was an emotional, even cathartic experience. And the courage and generosity of all who share their migration stories with museums like ours and the Migration Museum can never be underestimated. And there is also ultimately the contract of trust between the museum and the exhibition visitors in terms of presenting real people in their own authentic voices. The challenges posed in simultaneously honouring the validity and nuance of the stories our people were sharing, while crafting them into accessible and consumable formats for visitors to engage with, were enormous. Our former British migrants undertook two-hour interviews, utilising an oral history convention with questions eliciting long-form answers relating to life stories in their entirety. These people have been selected in order to represent storage at different life stages, so the emphasis of the questions focused on childhood or teenage, young adult and family years. These stories were edited down dramatically to around three to four minutes, distilled to an essence which would demonstrate that British migrant experiences were diverse, often complex and even difficult, and that these experiences could vary according to the time of life at which one migrated. There are stories of adventure and romance, loneliness and being bullied, independence and self-discovery, -discover, grief and sacrifice. While giving central place to real people telling their own stories, we wanted to visualise these stories in a new way for our museum. Animation choreographed with object theatre, images, film, sound design and text have offered an engaging way for us to bring to life the personal stories and the contexts in which they were situated. Melbourne-based animator Vera Babida created beautiful, gentle, highly empathetic animations which visitors watch in four physical story pods, overlaid with the storyteller's voice on a continuous loop. Personal objects are embedded in the animated stories and provide tangible touchstones to the storytellers. Importantly, the animating of the stories takes visitors back to a particular moment in time when the memory was being enacted and relayed by the storyteller. This was extremely important in our wish to highlight the life stages of our storytellers. It was a device to help visitors imagine the responses of, for example, a teenager having to leave, leave London, her friends, extended family and school in the 60s, or a child who was suddenly transplanted in Tasmania with no understanding of distance and permanence. It also enabled the comparison and contrast of experiences across particular life cycle experiences. Thus, the animations became vehicles for laid information about the context in which the personal experiences occurred, the impact of age and agency in the migration experience, and the diversity within and between stories in order to explode the myth that all British migrants' experiences were the same. And at the end of each of the stories, we felt it important to bring the story up to date so that it was not frozen in time, so that each person's story has a postscript 
and an image of them today. And we'll be uh, screening Jan's anim animation shortly so you can really understand what we've tried to achieve with bringing these stories to life. The exhibition concludes with an invitation to visitors to engage with a variety of contemporary Australians reflecting on questions which make this subject of relevance and interest today. British migrants, including some familiar names, such as children's author Paul Jennings and actor and author Magda Zabanski, children of British migrants, historians, community and First Peoples commentators, were asked questions including, what do we mean by an Australian identity? Is Australia still British? Is the term POM an insult? What does it mean to be British? And can anyone become an instant Australian? The reflections are diverse, at times confronting and always thought provoking. And visitors were able to leave their own responses to some of these questions on the graffiti boards. The exhibition development was a genuinely consultative process. To present stories in new ways, the exhibition team initially undertook a series of workshops with dramaturgs, sound designers, writers and performers. We then engaged a creative team that included an animator, designers, sound artists, user experience experts and multimedia developers. It consulted with historians and curators beyond our museum to test exhibition themes and narratives. And we conducted focus groups with British migrants and visitors to determine where the interest and relevance of such an exhibition lay. We included a range of first, pe first person voices from British migrants to contemporary commentators who all generously gave of their time, stories, photographs and knowledge. We believe that these moving and deeply personal human stories have resonated with our visitors and hopefully those in Adelaide as well and have demonstrated that our history and our collective stories are relevant and essential to inform debate about who we are today. It is always important to test our assumptions about the lives of other people, even those that migrated to Australia in huge numbers and from a culture and heritage of long-standing historical connection, and that these assumptions can indeed be deceiving. So I hope all of you who are watching, who are able, are able to get along to see the exhibition at the Migration Museum and support this terrific institution. So thanks very much. And now um, I'm going to introduce the animation. So we're going to play for you um, Jan's animation that appears in the exhibition, um, which will give you a really good idea um, of what uh, the animations look like and what we were trying to achieve. And after that, um, we'll go straight to uh, the woman herself, uh, Janet Coolan. Um, so she will emerge from being an animated character to the real deal. And um, it's particularly uh, appropriate that we are able then to shift into the, one of our storytellers who can actually really share with uh, you her own experiences um, of, of both her migrant experiences, um, perhaps the uh, experiences of finding her uh, story um, shared in an exhibition uh, for everyone to uh, enjoy. So I'll leave it now to the, put up the animation, thank you. home one day and she said, I'm fed up with this weather, I've had enough of it, why don't we emigrate to Australia? And my dad said, well, why don't you go and get some leaflets and we'll look at it? And that was the start of it. I was 17 at the time and I didn't want to go because I had a boyfriend, we were madly in love, I had a fabulous life in England. It was the beginning of the mod era, before that it had been American rock and roll mainly and then England developed its own bands, the Beatles, um, Jerry and the Pacemakers, Freddie and the Dreamers, all those, they all started up. Mercy Beats was taking off and it was our own sound. And because I came from that part of England, um, I, we loved it. We absolutely loved it. So I sulked on the boat, but after about three days, I, I realized that nobody took any notice of me. And so I decided to join in because everybody else was having a ball. As we were getting off the boat in Port Adelaide, 
um, one of the sailors said to my sister, well, you better put your, your watch back 20 years now. You're arriving in Adelaide. And he was spot on. There was no cafes. Everything closed at six o'clock. Shops weren't open on Saturdays. They, um, they were building the new city of Elizabeth. I think they started it in the 50s um, to bring out migrants um, because they were building lots of factories there. And it was meant to be what they called a satellite city. We looked at various houses and we eventually chose one in Elizabeth Vale and we all loved it. My sister and I went to a dance in Salisbury at the youth centre. All the girls there wore sticking out dresses and gloves and all that sort of thing and there we were in our mod gear and it was awful. <laughs> we thought, where have we come? We were just freaks absolute freaks uh, nobody asked us to dance that was in the days when boys always asked girls to dance I was saving up from the minute we got here to go back to England and about the middle of 1965 I think it was I booked my passage on a ship to go back dad saw an ad in the paper for a job working on Snowy Mountain Scheme. And he said to me, he said, look at this. He said, the money's really good. And he said, why don't you apply for it? Because he said, you'll see a bit more of Australia before you go back to England. And I thought that was a good idea. I just loved, loved it there. There was every nationality in the world. This dress, I bought it when I was in Cooma because we used to go to a lot of balls. Um, they were known as the snowy balls. And I loved it because it reminded me of the 1920s style, but it was a 60s style. I have a photo of wearing this when it was my farewell party in the girls' hostel in Cooma. So going there opened up this new world for me. It just hit me that I thought, I can't, I can't go back, I've changed. My boyfriend, he, we wrote to each other every day for almost two years. We were madly in love as you are at that age. So I knew I had to write. It took me days to write this letter and it was very, very hard, very, very hard. I knew deep down it was right, but it was very painful. Uh, I'd, I'd come a long way as a person um, and I'd come a long way in distance, 12,000 miles, but I might as well have gone to another universe, really. I, the change was that big. Is it my turn to talk? <laughs> yes, yes, please. Okay, sorry. Hi, I'm Jan Coolen, and that was me in the animation 56 years ago, mind you. <laughs> um, yes, it pretty well told a lot of um, uh, my story, um, quite briefly, but um, lots of things in between, perhaps I should mention. Um, uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank the people involved in this exhibition and um, what they've done, both in Melbourne and here, because um, I think it's wonderful that British migration is, is being acknowledged the way it is through this exhibition, because sometimes I think we've all felt that we've been the forgotten migrants. So uh, I really, um, I really am very thrilled about that. And it's been lovely working with all these people. Um, Yes, yeah, so as it said in, in the uh, animation, I had a brilliant life in England. I was at college. I went to jazz clubs, youth group, um, just the whole scene, the whole Mersey scene. I was a mod um, and I just thought it would go on like that until this terrible winter of 63 when everywhere was frozen and we hated it. And my sister uh, went and put a spoke in the wheel, didn't she? And, and went off and got some um, leaflets and brochures to come to Australia. Now, the brochures were very enticing. They showed happy, healthy people, sunshine, blue skies. Very, very enticing. And, um, but I was devastated. I just wouldn't go. And I never took part in any of the family discussions because as far as I was concerned, it wasn't going to happen. Well, it did. And... Uh, we travelled on the Irish mail train from our town in the north of England and I cried the whole way uh, and then I sulked on the boat because I didn't want to be there. But after 
a few days. I knew they were all having such a good time that I thought I'd better join in. And it turned out to be a wonderful trip. Um, we joined in everything. And, um, yeah, it was very enjoyable. Um, then, of course, we get to Port Adelaide and that famous line, turn your clock back 20 years because you're coming to Adelaide. Well, <laughs> that filled us with a bit of trepidation. Um, and I do have to say that if we'd gone by the um, welcome we had uh, to Australia, um, then we would have turned around and gone back. It was awful. Uh, we were shuttled off the ship into a tin shed um, and processed with some migration officials. No welcome of, of any sort, really. Then we were shuttled onto a bus, a couple of buses, and taken into Adelaide to the hostel. And the hostel was um, another thing. It was very basic. It wasn't long term. And the, um, the first thing that hit you was that the walls didn't reach the ceiling. So you could hear everything going on in everybody's rooms. Uh, communal dining, communal showers, um, that sort of thing. But it was only going to be for a short time, uh, which it was. Um, it, we arrived at a time when there was so much employment you had to pick. So within 24 hours virtually of arriving and being at the hostel, I had a job and, um, and off I went each day to that. Um, meanwhile, uh, we were taken, a family was taken by buses out to look at houses because um, mum and dad had committed to buy a house through the housing trust. Uh, they had sponsored mum and dad as £10 poems, so we were committed to buying a house, and uh, which we eventually did. And after a few weeks in the hostel, we moved to Elizabeth Vale into a, a beautiful house which was uh, spacious and clean, great big garden. We were just blown away, and especially our mum because. Um, in England, it had been all about the coal fires and the big cold house and that sort of thing. So she in particular was very happy. Again, we all got jobs straight away. I finished my job in Adelaide and walked straight into another one. Um, my brother went to school, but the rest of us just got jobs. And I have to say my um, first impression of working in an office full of Australian men um, was, <laughs> was like nothing I'd ever seen. Um, they used to tease me terrible because I had a very strong North of England accent. Um, and I didn't like Australian men. I thought, oh, I thought they were so uncouth. And, and I just, I didn't like them at all. <laughs> Not gentlemanly. And <laughs> I just couldn't take to them. We all settled into Australia, uh, lovely, and um, enjoyed the life, the lifestyle, the beaches, the food. We'd never seen so much fresh fruit in our life, ever, and that was a big thing. And, uh, and we loved it, and I did love it, but I was still, you know, uh, bent on going back to England after the two years was up. And so um, I was saving all the time until Dad saw the ad for people to work at the, on the snowy mountain scheme which i did i went there and i absolutely loved it i'd gone to a new world and this was in the fairly early days of the snowy mountain scheme um and there was every nationality in the world there it was a, a mini united nations and um the work was so interesting and um it was just a fantastic place um and while i was there um I met a Dutch migrant who, uh, whose family had um, emigrated to Adelaide in 1957. But we, we didn't start off romantically because he was on a working holiday going to New Zealand and then Canada and I was going back to England. But, you know, the best laid plans and um, came back to Adelaide with a view to, to going away back to England. Never worked out because I just couldn't go in the end. I changed very dramatically and um and my my dutch migrant he went off to new zealand but he came back he never got to canada and so what we did then we went back to the snowy mountains and worked there got married and the rest is history <laughs> and um we now have uh, we've we had three ch children and eight grandchildren 
and a very fulfilling and happy life. Um, and we, we still carry on our English traditions and our Dutch traditions and our children and grandchildren have all grown up with that. So um, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else I should fill you in on. Is there anything else you want me to fill in on, Mandy? Thanks, Jan. That's really lovely rounding out of the story that we saw in the animation. I've got one question, if I may, and then and then we better move to the general questions. Yes. Can you tell us a bit more about what you were doing uh, on the Snowy Hydro scheme and oh, yes. and what 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 the um, what it was like? Were you living in a, a in a work camp there? What well, were you uh, yeah, I was living in, in a girls' hostel. Uh, strictly run, I might, might say, by a matron. <laughs> no boys allowed over the doorstep or anything like that. So it was strictly run. Um, we all had our own room. And, and then there was a big mess, a canteen, um, where everybody went to eat. Uh, there were um, men's hostels separate. And then again, there was also working men camps. Um, way back then, in the early 60s, uh, it was still... Um, pretty, not primitive, but um, uh, not what you'd see nowadays in, in working camps. Um, pretty rough and tumble, um, especially way up in the mountains. But the hydro, uh, the scheme was built to um, supply uh, hydroelectric power uh, from the Snowy River and was it the Murrumbidgee, I think? I've forgotten. And um, so it's a massive project. Um, I worked for a field construction engineer, I was his secretary, um, and there was a great big head office um, in Cooma, and so we just had to walk from our hostel to there. The work was ongoing, solidly night, uh, day, day after day, um, and then there was the workers out in the mountains, the, the people doing the drilling of the tunnels and, and all that sort of thing. So it was a massive scheme, but I'm very proud to say it was one of the, uh, the only schemes in Australia to actually um, come in on budget, as far as I can remember, and pretty much on time. Um, so it was, it was a, a very massive scheme. And then um, because it was so multicultural, there was lots of little coffee shops and little club things in, in, the, in the town, a bit like a little cowboy town in those days. Um, so you'd get a cafe with all your, your Hungarians and your Slavic people and uh, they'd be uh, playing cards and gambling the night away and then you'd have another little coffee shop where people went and danced and played record, you know, that sort of thing. It was just fantastic. And, um, yeah, so... Um, I just met so many wonderful people who I'm still in touch with and um, uh, we, all, we all say it was just a very special part of our life. Thanks Jan, that's a really, again, a really lovely insight into something that most of us have only, um, you know, we have a vague idea of, but yeah. it's great to hear a bit more about it. Can um, I just tell you that, yep. that uh, <laughs> the most frightening thing about it is that there was probably a hundred men to one woman. There was so many men. There was not not a lot of women. They they were mainly in the offices, the the women. But uh, there were so many men. When you, you walked into the canteen and the mess, you never hardly saw a woman's face. It was quite daunting. So, yeah. in some ways, living in a hostel with the other women might have been quite nice. Oh, it was nice. Yes, yeah, it was good. Yes. Mm. All right, now I'll just move on to um, the, some of the questions that people have put in the Q&A. Thank you. Um, the first one I might perhaps ask Jim. Um, somebody's wondering about uh, the, the term New Australians, um, saying why were we called New Australians? So, and is that a title that was encouraged? So do you, have you got any sense about that, Jim? I think the term was used by some politicians. I can't quite date it. Um, I think it's a, it's a product of the 1950s and it's meant by politicians to be complimentary and you must be nice to them and so on. Um, yeah. But of course, you know, it, 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 it took over from terms like new chums and so on, which you had before the Second World War. Um, and, uh, but it, had, it seemed to have a limited timing, I think. Um, I think it didn't last for too long. 
but it may have done in certain places. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and I've, I've got another one for you, Jim, which is about um, the, the uh, geographical makeup of migrants in terms of regions and cities, and yeah. then also where people settled in, in Australia in terms of regions and cities. Mm -hmm. Okay, in, ter in terms of the bulk, um, most of the British migrants, even the majority at least, came from the London and home counties area and the northern industrial areas like Jans, you know, Lancashire, the, the Yorkshire towns as well. And in Scotland, uh, the industrial areas across from Glasgow and uh, to a slightly lesser extent from Edinburgh. So that's where the bulk come from. But I mean, it, you also have to remember that the, what Moya was stressing, the diversity of, of migrants. There's a great diversity in their origins as well and diversity of what they choose to do. So. On the Australian side, of course, the great majority come to the big cities. Uh, there's absolutely no question of that. Um, but it's a suburban development in lots of ways. So m most people will end up settling with native Australians, native born Australians in the suburbs of the, the larger cities. Um, but there's some surprising things that happen, I suppose, on the edge of that, where you get people who are thoroughly urban in their origins. And we had we, one of the 10 pound palms book, we talk about one family, that they're representative of, of, of a small minority of others who uh, had thoroughly urban occupations, office, office manager or whatever, and decide to go to Tasmania and run sheep you know, and take, take up. Uh, take up rural pursuits and uh, sometimes that lasts for a very long time sometimes it crashes but um, uh, but it, it's something that Australia conjures up for people to uh, to be able to take on something different if they feel confident in themselves about it. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Um, another one that I might, oh Moya, yeah? I was, oh, I, was, I was just going to add Mandy that um, uh, it's interesting too that uh, some of those young people, especially who came in the 60s, but also in the 50s, who really saw it as an opportunity to um, to, to travel, uh, not just to get to Australia, but around Australia. So you get, um, you know, a lot of those sort of early I, sort of um, examples of backpackers, really. So people yeah. who hit the road and were wor working in um, regional towns or moved between states to be nurses or... Um, one of our storytellers was, you know, became, she went from being a snake dancer to a Dillaroo. Um, so there was a really interesting uh, story, a lot of mining, there, you know, young men who would go and work in mines in Western Australia. So there was a, quite a lot of transient movement around the place too, because for some of those people, it was really about adventure as, as much as anything. Mm. Yes, thank you. That's something we often forget about migration, that uh, people often intend to do it uh, differently to how the policy policymakers might have framed it. Um, Jan, a, a, a question for you, if you wouldn't mind taking yourself off mute. Um, so, somebody's asked about um, the actual journey and whether or not it was um, a deterrent to people going going back, or, or how. It's really a question about how onerous was the journey. So you came by ship. I know mm. some people came by plane, but you were saying it was you, you didn't experience it as an onerous journey, but no, um, no, no. It, was, it was it it was like going on the cruise really. Um, it was an Italian ship. One of the things was we'd never had Italian food in the north of England. It was you know roast beef and cabbage and dumplings, and on the ship it was pasta. We'd never heard of pasta and things like that. So um, that was all new. But it was like a cruise, really. Uh, there was lots of um, dances. Um, there was fancy dress balls. There was games. There was everything you could think of. Um, so it was like a great big holiday, really. Mm. And Jim, uh, oh, oh, Jim first and then Moya. The question is, how representative was that, I guess? Oh, it, I mean, the thing is, like, like everything else, there's huge diversity in these experiences. And if you go to some of the early ones, it depends on the ship you're on. You know, many of the ships were just luxury to, to people. They, I mean, they, before 1954, there was still some rationing in, uh, in, in place in, in Britain. And they suddenly, that didn't apply on the boat. You got everything that you needed. However, some of them talk about it as an absolute horror ship. You know, they had terrible times on it. Um, 
and and by the 1960s you're getting before planes start taking over from ships uh, you're getting quite luxurious ships are coming on the Canberra starts in 1961 and people sort of rave about that but one of the things particularly in the 1950s that we got from a lot of people was about how and this goes back to the, the conditions of migration very often people applied to come before they were married they didn't get they couldn't get married then because they had no housing nowhere to live uh, and they were going to have to live with their parents and they didn't want to do that so they got married and then a few days later they're on the ship to Australia they get on the ship and they discover that everything's segregated men down there and women up there and so it creates you know, one couple talked about how there were advice groups uh, telling these couples to go up to that lifeboat because nobody's in it. Um, and so you get these kinds of these kind of stories that come out of the very conditions of, of shipping. But the, but in the 60s, it tends to be a bit better. But there's always small boats that will give you difficulty. Uh, and it is. It's a, I mean, it makes a difference. Um, people, a lot of people bond on those ship journeys and they remain retain relationships for many years afterwards, yeah. Thank you, Moya? I was just going to, I, I, I won't dwell on it. I was just going to add that, um, as Jim said, with that some of the ones that were terrible, they were, the, in the early days, they were frequently converted troop ships. So they were, they were often very basic, whether you were from migrating from Britain and Europe. And I was also just going to mention that um, it's interesting to think in, in this world we're in now where a lot of us travel and, you know, we move around the globe really easily. But for a lot of these migrants, um, this was the first time some of them had even left their own counties, let alone had left um, the UK. So it was an enormous um, move to, to, um, to pick up and uh, take this. It was about a six week journey um, across the other side of the world. So, so for some people who never had a holiday, this was... Um, this Right. Thank you. Oh, yes. Can I just say one thing about the boat, what's going on from what Jim was saying. Um, a lot of families were split up. It would be mothers and daughters on one side and fathers and sons the other. But we were lucky, if you could call it that, the five of us were all in the one cabin. And <laughs> so it was pretty full on. And my dad was a trumpet player. So he wanted to practice his trumpet. He'd sit on the bottom bunk and put blankets over his head and practice his trumpet. <laughs> Thank you, that's lovely. Now I've got one more question and I'm afraid it's the last one we're gonna have time for. Um, um, and I guess it's a question, if you could all just give me a short reflection on this. So it's about the, it's about the, term, ten, the term 10 pound POM. Um, and I know Jim that your now classic book took that as okay. its as its main title. Um, the question is, what kind of a term was that at the time? Was it a term of endearment, a term of abuse, abuse? And has it changed over time? So Jim, if you could go first. Well, of course, 10 pound palm is one thing, whinging palm is another. Uh, and uh, the whinging palm was clearly a term of abuse. There's no question of that, but it did get into much more common usage. Uh, and 10 pound palms, it could either be it was used by politicians sometimes, uh, and they would use that in a, you know, these are our 10 pound palms, we have to look after them, and they're making a great contribution, and, and, and so on, and we want more of them. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that the use of 10 pound palm is, is, it cuts both ways. Sometimes it's just, you know, it's very linked to those other terms of abuse, like winching palm and palmy bastard, and, 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 and so on. Uh, but those other two are much more abusive than, than the 10 pound POM itself, which can be neutral at times. Yeah. Dan, were you ever called a 10 pound POM? Sorry. Um, I was called a POM. I can't recall being called a 10 pound POM, uh, but I was called a POM a lot, especially in the early days when my accent was a lot stronger. And as I say, working in an office full of of Aussie males, um, yeah, I was called a pom. It didn't, it didn't upset me though. It didn't bother me. I was okay with that because all the other migrants had nicknames. You know, yes. the Italians, the Greeks, the Dutch. Mm. They all had. They were all called different names too. Mm. Yes, some of which we won't share. Um, and Moya, to, to you, I, I seem to remember that ten pound poms was the working title for the exhibition for a bit. Do you want to tell us um, what your take on that is and why, why it wasn't called that in the end? Um, actually, sorry to correct you, but it really never oh. was 
was um, only because I mean it, it was a sto it was a phrase that lurked around because it seems that it was the it was an obvious title that a lot of people would have would have heard of. But we had a problem. We really talked about whether we should use a term like POM in the title because it could be because for some people and all the anecdotal evidence as Jim has suggested it, it's for some people it was quite an insult um, for others they found it to sort of a term of endearment it really depended on who was saying it and how it was said and how it was heard um, like any insult and I guess um, so we didn't really want to include that word in the title although we did want to talk about it in the exhibition um, uh, which we do. The other thing I'll just on a little more lighthearted note is that um, POM tends to be uh, more used for the English and I can tell you that any Scot who would be called a POM would really take umbrage with you because they would not see themselves as included in that definition which also goes to show that a sort of cultural and uh, regional um, diversity going on but I think POM is yeah we all of our people talk about um, most most didn't really like the term, uh, I would have to say, and found it a, a bit of an insult. But whether you could, on the scale of insults that many migrants have received, um, in the, it, there have certainly been worse ones, that's for sure. Can I just right. add to that? Yep. Uh, um, when we launched, uh, well, we did a Mel Melbourne launch, and Julia Gillard, at the Migration Museum in the Melbourne, actually, and Julia Gillard launched it. and. She, at the beginning, was at pains to stress that she had come out in 1963 with her family, but she came from Wales and she was not a POM. Thank you. That, that's lovely. So we'll end, we'll end the panel there. Can I just say thank you again to Jim Hammett and Jan Cool and, and Moy McFadgen. It's been really lovely this evening to have a chat and to share our views. Um, just to the participants, um, get along to the Migration Museum. The exhibition is open now until the 22nd of November and we are a welcoming and simultaneously COVID safe environment. If you'd like to bring a, bring a, a group of people, please give us a ring or send us an email first so we can organise to, to do that safely. Um, the, uh, if you'd like to know more about Talking History or the History Trust, hop onto our website and you can, you can sign up for our e-newsletters. The next Talking History uh, will be on Tuesday the 8th of September at 5.30pm Adelaide time, Central Standard Time. Um, and historian Tom Gara will be talking about his research on deaths in cricket. So this is partly about deaths in cricket and it's partly about the amazing things you can do with Trove. Um, so sign up and come along and listen to what Tom's got to say. Bookings are now open on the History Trust website. So once again, thank you, everybody. Um, have a lovely evening and hopefully we'll see you again soon. Thank you.